The Arctic char is a, a relic really from, uh, from the Ice Age. You, in northern latitudes, in Scandinavia, etc., and northern Canada, they're actually uh, migratory fish. Where just like salmon, they'll go to sea to feed and then they'll come back into fresh water to spawn. Now, here we are at Coniston in the English Lake District, the third largest of the lakes. This is one of the few places where it got landlocked after the uh, ice retreated. There's only nine lakes that we know of that were in England that hold the char and they're all in the Lake District. And so the weather's not too bad for us right at the moment, so we'll go out and see what we can find. That's the most important thing for a kickoff. You've got to, this is called the lazy line that enables you to bring the line in from the end of the rod and it needs tying off first because uh, once you've got that two pound weight on, if your hand slips and that line goes, you've lost your gear. That, that's, that'll save you, that'll get your gear back. It'll be in a tangle, but it will save you losing your gear. Years ago, when we were a lot younger, um, you could come out and you get probably easily 20 or 30 fish in a morning's fishing, but they were often sort of four or even five to a pound. And the thing about that is that, you know, the, the actual amount of fish you were catching is probably, in terms of weight, probably similar to what it is today. Now today, your average fish will be a good 10 ounce fish, quite a few rather larger and so the actual weight of fish you catch even though you maybe only catch up to 10 in the morning now the actual weight of fish will probably be quite similar perhaps even slightly more now the reasons for it well it could be down to climate I and mean, we've had a we had quite a long run of quite mild winters does that have an effect nobody really knows I mean you talk to fish uh, you know, fish specialists don't really have many answers. Uh, apparently they've done some work recently on Windermere and found that some of the spawning beds on Windermere had become quite choked with silt. So that maybe has an effect as well. Where the Coniston's affected similarly. Difficult to tell without putting the work in and, and uh, understanding a little more about it. The big difference between Coniston and Windermere is that most of Windermere's fish were autumn spawners and most of Coniston's fish were spring spawners and that's why we have a slightly different season. 
and you have to say maybe they take the uh, the trigger for spawning from different uh, different sources maybe on Windermere it's like it is with trout for deer length things like that and maybe on Coniston it's to do with or historically it's been to do with snow melt a bit like the rainbow trout in America so when you get a flush of cold water coming through the lake that's maybe their trigger to, to spawn and of course if you have a run of mild winters you don't get that flush of cold water in the spring which maybe means that they don't get the same trigger to spawn the theory it's never been proven but you know it, it may it might stand up to scrutiny at some point the fish you catch now the fit they're in really good condition but as we said before there's not so many of them um, they probably take a lot more catching as well uh, when when they're not what we describe as on when they're not taking well they would take an awful lot more catching now than they would before. Um, but, you know, it's it's an interesting thing to have experienced, having gone from being able to catch, you know, a good haul in the morning to only catching two or three in the morning, and now where we are at the moment, where the fish are relatively on, and, you know, fucking know what they're doing, can come away with a dozen fish in the morning. But, they're, but they are fit fish, they're good fish, they're in good nick. Well, years ago, um, the fish on here were originally harvested by the monks as a food source and uh, I'm led to believe they, they use minnows to catch them with as well and somebody came up with an idea that you could use um, metal that flashed and obviously the gear has been designed from there uh, up to the, the modern stuff we're using now. It hasn't changed a big lot, the, the, the lines um, are nylon now rather than the uh, braided flax that used to be used years ago. Um, we use different types of metal, brass, silver, copper, bronze, some laminated, you'll get bronze on one side of the loo and maybe brass on the other. Um, use a two pound plum weight on the bottom to, to keep the lines down in the water. Eight lures on the line, originally the lures were all fished in a row. Um, the top lure would probably be 30, have a 30 or 40 feet line and the bottom lure We'll probably only have nine or ten feet of line and in between there'd be space so they would all be fishing in a row so the idea of that was when you come to a shoal of fish the lures would be all coming through the fish at the same time you'd have more chance of catching a few fish at the same time um, nowadays we don't fish like that all all the uh, the dropper lengths are the same around 18 foot long because we take into account you're rowing at roughly two miles an hour so that by the time you've got the line, start bringing the line and when you've got a fish on, the other lures will be coming through anyway. And uh, we think the longer the length of dropper, the more chance you have of losing the fish. So we're fishing about 18 feet of line on the, on the lures. The lines uh, are coming off a copper shackle, uh, designed to hang on the nail. So when you, you're bringing the lines in, you can hang the shackle on the nail, which frees your hands up. You've got both. You can use both hands. Uh, the lines are brought in hand over hand. Obviously, you've got to bring all the lures in till you get to you get to the lure that's got the fish on. Sometimes the fish isn't on there. You've got to bring all the lures in to check them, and then you've got to pull them back out again. Um, and that's basically how we do it. Sometimes when the, the fish is good, both fish, both the rods are ringing at once, and usually. You'll go for the one which you think has got the biggest fish on, the, the one that's ringing, ringing the loudest. Um, years ago when the fishing was good, there was probably a dozen boats, 15 boats fishing on here, where now there's only two or three diehard fishermen who are fishing for the char at the moment. It used to be a tradition with the old quarrymen who quarried the slate quarries in, in this area. A lot of those chaps were char fishermen, they're quite sporty, they fish fish for char and the trout, kept ferrets, ran, ran lurches and things like that. Um, they used to run home overnight from, from working on the old man and get in the boats and come out and fish overnight. 
because the, the fishing isn't as good as it used to be, there isn't the same similar volume of, of pressure on, on the fishing now. There's, uh, there's only two or three boats fishing out here. Bit of colour about that. Huh? Stunning is that. There was uh, two old quarrymen who taught me how to charfish, showed me how to make the baits, told me where to go on the lake, where it was safe to fish, and where you'd lose char tackle and that. And this tell you about these marks like Beck Leaven and Fur Island and Napping Tree and these marks are still on here now uh, down below Fur Island there. Fur Island's a really good spot to catch char. It's, it's, uh, it's not actually an island as such but uh, it's covered in, uh, in trees and it juts out into the lake and it's, it's almost like a reef in the lake uh, you've got to stay quite a long way out when you're fishing by it or you'll lose, you lose gear, you'll catch the bottom, it's a really bad bottom there. And the, the old guys used to say stay well out till you get to the Scotch pine tree on the side and that Scotch pine tree is still there now. That's, a, that's the sort of thing I like about this sort of fishing, it's traditional, there's still, there's still the marks on the lake now that were there 30, 40, 50 years ago and uh, you know you can almost since these old lads fishing out every out on the lake 60 or 70 years ago it's, it's, it's still basically the same lake with the same features features on it that you know you can you can picture it in your head when they were talking about it you can see what they were talking about you know it's, it's still here are these the features on the lake some char fishermen just fish their own waters don't try anywhere else but uh, Jeff and myself have been a bit more adventurous over the years we've tried Fishing most of the, the lakes in the Lake District that contain char. We've obviously fished Coniston, Windermere, Crummock and Buttermere, uh, Thirlmere and Ennerdale. When, when you could fish Ennerdale, there's no char fishing to be had on Ennerdale now because uh, there's a protection notice on the fish. We've also ventured further afield, been to the Scottish Highlands. With limited success, we fished on Loch Arcaig, had char on there, not very big. Although there is potentially some massive char in there, but we didn't catch any of them. We fished on Loch Tay, caught nice char in there. Uh, we tried fishing on Loch Urn, we didn't have any fish at all on there. Uh, we were invited out to Loch Melvin to fish for the, the char on that water. We didn't actually catch any char there. We caught one or two small trout on a, a decent one one morning, about five pound in weight. But we. Uh, we really struggled to catch char out there. We, we fished um, on another water in Ireland for char. Again, on that water, we didn't catch any char. I think it was Loch, was it Loch Ern? Loch Esk, sorry, Loch Esk. But saying that, you could fish on Coniston, even though I've, we've fished on Coniston for 30 odd years, you could come on here and not catch a char at certain times of the year. So sometimes, it's, you know, you just got to land on it right. You need a bit of luck as well. A Loch Tay fish really well, somewhat similar to our char, they were a bit darker in colour but uh, they were a nice char around three quarters of a pound weight and really made the bell ring and all. What was uh, significant up there were where you used to fish in waters down here that might be 150 feet deep. I think Loch Tay was, it was over about five or six hundred feet deep where we were fishing even though we were just fishing the top, the top layer we actually caught char in there which was again quite interesting. It's, it is interesting to go on other waters and uh, see what the fish are like in there, see what they look like. The, the char in the Lake District, even though the lakes are fairly in close proximity, the colorations of the char are, are quite different. Your Windermere char are quite bland, quite, quite a white looking fish. The way your Crummock char and your Buttermere char, they're more of, have got a tinge of yellow on them. They're obviously char, but they're different, a different color and energy, a, a different color as well. Um, fill me a char, somewhat similar to Coniston char, though not as well fed, they're a bit leaner um, and not as big. 
But it is just it is interesting to go on other waters. Me and Jeff have uh, been on quite a few waters over the years, and uh, it's good to get away from your out of your comfort zone and go on on, on different lakes and, and try them for the char. So years ago, uh, they used to pop the char, both from Coniston and Windermere. They used to uh, originally go down to uh, to London in uh, literally just char pots, which are quite shallow pots, and they used to have pictures of char on the outside. Um, originally, they went down by stagecoach, and then latterly they went down on the uh, on the railways. Um, the, the way to pot a char really is to cook it, and then you just preserve it in clarified butter, very much like a potted shrimp. And it was quite a delicacy. In fact, they uh, used to go down for, for royalty in the 17th century. Um, so King Charles probably ate char out of Windermere, um, probably before he had his head cut off. But um, the uh, so it kind of died out really, uh, probably in the early 20th century. Um, but it's, you can still get these char pots now. Uh, they're, they're antique, obviously, but they go for quite a quite a tidy sum. I think there's one in the Ruskin Museum, but I, I have heard of them going for up to three or four hundred pounds a piece. This is quite an important part of the process of uh, char fishing is boxing the tackle or boxing up as we call it. Because uh, if you don't get this right, the next time you come out fishing, everything comes out in a tangle. So you've got to take a bit of care, making sure all the baits are in the right order and all the lines are nicely stored away for, for next time when you're going to use it.